Hello everyone, Christopher Beast here, and today I will be attempting to explain the endings to Signalis. Signalis is a new indie retro horror game on PC, Switch, Xbox, and PlayStation. For those who own Xbox Steam Pass, it does come free with that as well. The game is a Lovecraftian inspired Resident Evil-esque horror game that was made by a team of only two devs and shows prowess as one of the best horror games I've played this year and possibly really ever. If you haven't had a chance to play or experience this game for yourself, I highly advise you do so before watching this video. But for those of you who just want those endings explained, well, let's just get right into this. Before getting into these endings proper, I want to quickly remind us of some context that will greatly help in understanding these endings. Before getting into the actual end, there is a fake out ending. During this, our character attempts to enter the Penrose to see Arion, but breaks her arm and is injured due to Falke. Despite this, Elster boots back up after a short memory sequence, re-enters the Penrose, and steals parts from a dead Elster before descending back into Hell, claiming she has a promise to complete. So Signalis has three main endings and one secret ending. In this video, we don't remember what all four of these endings potentially mean. However, Signalis is not a game of absolutes, and it is very hard, if not impossible, to tell if something is true or absolute. So these interpretations are just my own, and feel free to disagree in the comments below. Getting into the first of these three main endings, we have the Weave ending. This ending is arguably the worst, as well as the easiest to get ending, being achieved by playing cowardly and running away from enemies rather than facing them. As punishment for playing the game like a speedrunner, you get the worst ending. In the weave ending, we see Elster ultimately decides to weave the ship and Ariana beyond, directly stating, In the end, I had to leave you behind, but it's too much. Forgive me. She then walks out into the desert before ultimately succumbing to her wounds and collapsing in the sand to die akin to the many other dead Elsters we see in the fakeout ending. This ending can be seen as a complete failure of Elster's ambitions, and the clearly bad ending of the game, punishing the player for their cowardice earlier in the game, and seeing how it's the easiest ending to get, it's really no surprise it isn't a happy one. There is a bit more to add to this. First, the Elster in this ending is depicted without the armor she acquired during the fakeout ending, suggesting that this is not the Elster that we follow, but rather more likely one of those dead Elsters I mentioned earlier from that fakeout ending. Also, it should be noted that her statement of, it is too much, forgive me, suggests that she does remember what the promise is, in fact I'll get back into later, but rather cannot enact what the promise requires her to do. From here we can head to the next main game ending, the memory ending. This ending is of moderate difficulty to get, and as of such some consider it to be a bittersweet good ending. In this ending we see Elster finally reunited with her love Arion, however Arion has forgotten who she was. Elster is rapidly succumbing to her wounds, and ultimately just requests to be able to lie next to Arion and pass away. To some, this is a good ending. Elster is able to spend her last moments next to Arion and pass away along with her, most likely Arion passing away due to being awoken from cryostasis and the health problems that she sustained prior to going into stasis. However, there's some in-game notions that go against the notion that this is a good ending. First, to acquire this ending, you must have high circle stats. Circle, meaning, you know, circular or, you know, cyclical, an implication that suggests this ending is not an ending, but rather just another step in the process. This can be reinforced by Elster saying, please, just let me stay by your side a little longer, a statement that means she isn't quite ready to end the cycle, and wishes to stay in the dream with Arion a little bit longer. Next, in this ending, Elster is donning our Elster's gear suggesting that if the cycle truly isn't over due to the promise not being completed and the implications of the circle, then this could easily be the dead Elster unit that we can steal parts from during the fakeout ending. If this is to be considered true, then following this ending, we assume that Ariane as the dreamer is distorted and consumed by the flesh, and in the process creates the last realm of the dream, a realm made of memories she has or the final mission of the game. Until this realm too collapses, or is consumed by the flesh due to the decay of her psyche. If we accept all of that, then this ending should be seen as an absolute event that happened as part of the cycle, as part of the circle, but did not bring an end to the cycle or circle, and as of thus can't be really seen as a true definitive ending. 
There's another interesting thing to note with this ending. The sprite used when Arianne states she doesn't remember Elster is a recolor of the sprite used in the Falke boss fight. It is named End underscore Arianne underscore Falke. This is curious because it greatly resembles other sprites we see of Arianne, meaning that Falke and Arianne by the end looked very similar to each other. And combined with the name of the sprite having Falke's name in it, could suggest more is going on here. Maybe even this isn't truly our Arianne, or our Arianne has been lost, but I think that is a little bit too far of a stretch, it's just something I'd like to bring up to note here with the file names. Next we can move on to the last of the main endings, and this one is called Promise. With a name such as Promise, and Arianne's Promise being such a major part of the endings, it's easy to understand why this is the hardest to acquire ending, and personally the ending that I view as the canonical final end of the game. In this ending, once again Elster arrives before an await Arianne. However, this time Arianne actually remembers Elster, and is here that Arianne is able to remind Elster that she must complete the promise. The promise, this entire time, being to kill Arianne. Elster then reluctantly strangles Arianne to death, before succumbing to her own wounds and passing away by her side. This ending to me represents a final ending, an end to the pain and suffering and to the cycle as a whole. This is supported by the game referring to the stats required to achieve this as death, a symbolism that, in this case, both sides can finally have a final demise, as well as the process to achieving this ending requiring the killing of many enemies and having a high playtime showcasing a general destruction of the cycle as a whole. There's also many quotes from this ending that support this ending representing a final and good ending, one of the largest being the clock finally hitting zero, an act that represents a final end to the cycle of pain that everyone was stuck in. Overall, this ending to me represents freedom through death for everyone involved, for by through this small act of pain, the overall pain of everyone involved will finally end and everyone can rest in peace. So while it certainly doesn't seem happy, ending a nightmare is far better than being stuck in it forever. On the notion of being stuck in it forever, we arrive at the secret and final ending of the game, and it is this ending that is certainly the most different than the other three. To begin with, this one does not need you to even fight Falk in order to acquire it. Rather, there is a secret puzzle one must do, and upon completing it, they will unlock this ending. The puzzle involves using secret keys and codes to unlock the large safe in Arianne's room. Upon doing so, we find a lily. Interacting with it, we see Elster placed upon an altar of a ritual. He then pans out to see various dead bodies behind the pillar. Next to the altar, these bodies seemingly being our main cast of characters, for it pans to the top to see an empty coffin of sorts with a strange artifact in its center. Then we see the Penrose, before it scrolls up to reveal an eye in the sky then the screen flashes, remember our promise, before fading to reveal Ulster and Arianne dancing on the Penrose. So this one is clearly the most cryptic and raises the most questions as to what is actually going on here. So to start, let's address the steps to getting this ending. First, we have some codes. These codes are the same numbers that flash on the screen following the first reading of the King in Yellow, and also the same codes that appear all throughout the game. This likely represents that whatever happens in this ending, is relating to having a level of control over the power that the book bestows, as by using the wisdom or numbers he grants us, we attempt to control his power. Next, we have the keys. To get this ending, one will need three different keys. These keys are the key of sacrifice, the key of love, and the key of eternity. These keys, to me, each represent one part of the symbolism behind what this ending means. First is love. This symbolizes the manifestation of Elster's love for Arianne, she loves her so much that she is unable to complete the promise, and would rather just be able to be with her forever. Next is eternity. This suggests and contextualizes what is exactly being done by this ritual. Elster is creating a new cycle or a new moment of eternity, but one that allows her to be with Arianne forever. Finally, sacrifice. She is sacrificing our main cast, either literally using their souls and existence to fuel her creation, or figuratively by stating that they are doomed to suffer within the cycle forever while she escapes. We also must consider where the safe is. The safe is located within Arianne's room right behind the desk she used to use, and where the King of Yellow rests. The safe is something dear to Arianne, and by accessing it, it could represent that this action Elster moves closer to Arianne, in the creation of her own cycle and realm, akin to how Arianne created her own cycle and realm. 
but much more focused and dedicated than the failed realm that Arion created, as Arion created a realm in a decaying, dying state while she was supposed to be in dormancy, while Elster is creating a realm purposefully for a reason. If anything, the usage of the codes reinforces that Elster is better and more experienced user of these abilities than even the strongly bioresonant Arion. Then we have the Lily itself. The Lily as a flower represents purity, but in this case it seems to instead symbolize the symbol for lesbian love, with its name in the files even being Yuri, suggesting how this is the result when Elster's love for Arion is too strong to allow her to fulfill the promise she made to Arion. But there's more to cover. The ritual which shows pillars that strongly resemble the graves of nowhere, reinforcing that the sacrifice that Elster makes here is at the cost of the souls of the rest of the cast, and an empty grave in the center, perhaps representing where Arion should lie if the proper action was taken, but that she is instead sacrificing them to prevent Arion from lying in rest. It should also be added that this ritual is seen before in the game, though due to it flashing quickly on the screen, it's something a lot of us missed, and this was during the fakeout ending. Its name in the fake out ending is Grabber, which means grave, and implies that this process has either happened before, likely Arion when she created the original cycle, or maybe even a past Elster already did something. Or we could consider that just something that the fake out ending predicts as part of the future, seeing how time is not really linear in this situation. Then we get to the artifact. This is the artifact that appears in the game's logo and should be seen as a physical item used to create the cycles both for Arion in the main cycle and now Elster in the ending. Or it could be seen as a physical manifestation of someone having the ability to do so. If they have this item, then they can create cycles. Either way, it is something that is integral to having the ability to distort reality the level that both dreamers do. In the files, the subject is called a tesseract, which is a cube in the fourth dimension, reinforcing that this item is what's distorting not just reality, but time itself in this situation. Regardless, following the depiction of this item, we see the Penrose landing on a planet, the dream that the two pilots had ever since they took off from their homeworld, and their pointless adventure into space seemingly finally having a purpose. However, the panup reveals they are still being observed. On one hand, this could be the King of Yellow, looking down at the two of them, granting Elster the power to create this new dream. And on the other hand, this could be Arion, looking down from her dream at this new pocket dream that Elster has created judging her for her failure to fulfill the promise she made. It is then that the promise is mentioned again, clearly articulating that this ending does not in any way fulfill the promise, meaning Arion will not die and the cycle will not end. Rather, she will now never die and the cycle has been renewed completely. Finally, we can consider with the final waltz between the two main characters. To begin this scene, it really has a much negative-toned recreation of the Penrose simulation-memory that occurred earlier in the game, following the fake-out ending. If you remember, from that scene, it wasn't reality, but really kind of a flashback or maybe even a recreation of an event by Ariana's dream. But this scene, this time, is much more negative in its toning, much darker, much, you know, gr more grim. And we can actually look into the, you know, discoveries within the code to reinforce this finding. First, the model of the final version we see of Arion is named Body Texture Ghost, and the model has tendrils around her arms and legs, which reinforces this negative connotation that this ending is not a good one, but rather the embodiment of the blind love of Elster into a new dreamed reality that is only for her own personal happiness. When questioning if the Lotus ending is better than the Promise ending, I've seen people really divided. And personally, I hold my preference, evidently, with the promise ending. I think its finality and closure it offers is preferable than the fake promises made with a god beyond humanity's grasp that the Lotus ending implies. But that's just my interpretation. Feel free to have your own and feel free to disagree with me. Signalius, as I said earlier, is not a game that, you know, gives away clear answers. I don't think there's such thing as a wrong answer here. There's just the endings and the answers that we prefer to lean into. On that note, it is time to close out the video. But before I do so, I'd like to say, if you are a Signalis fan and would like to participate further in this discussion, I have linked in the description below the unofficial Signalis Discord. It's a really chill place filled with theorists and fans alike. I'm sure you guys would enjoy your time there. Also, all information in this video that referenced the game's files that was really possible thanks to the Redditors over on the Signalis Reddit. I will have their work linked below when it was referenced, 
Um, so really without them, it wouldn't have been possible to do any of the stuff I did with the actuation of the code because I don't know how to do that type of stuff. So huge thanks to them for making that possible. Though that's all I've got for you guys today. I really love this game and I'm curious what your guys' thoughts on it and did sad things were. But this has been Christopher Beast and I hope to see you all next time.